So welcome everyone. Welcome to the fall 2023 uh, webinar slash seminar series uh, from the graduate student community. Uh, today we have our speaker Brianna Reina. Uh, first, yeah. So first a little bit about our GSC leadership team for the academic year 23-24. We have Roshan and Rachel as our co-chairs uh, for this year. Then we have our publicity team consisting of Andrew and I. Then we are we have a youth support team. Uh, we have Anirban, Swapnil, Mayank, Mohammad, Latif, Pilani, Noreen, Suraj, Sivaish, and Lewis. And we are all uh, working under the wonderful mentorship of Dr. Farooq Mistri. Uh, we have our regular leadership meeting for GSC on Wednesdays at 5.50 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. So if you would like to join us, uh, please contact Rachel and Roshan. Uh, we can send you the invite link. Also, if you do decide to join us, uh, please become a member of our GSC leadership team uh, on Engage also by scanning this QR code. Okay. And uh, we also have a LinkedIn page and a Facebook page where we post all our upcoming events. Uh, so do uh, check those out. And if you want, we can send the link for those as well. Or you can sc scan the QR code here. Then we have a YouTube page uh, where we upload all our webinars. So in case there, uh, there is any particular webinar that you would like to rewatch it or you missed it, you can go check the YouTube page out and uh, see the videos. Uh, we have a Dave and Susan Bird team room, which is available for all GSC members to use. And it has some basic amenities like couches, whiteboard, coffee pot. So if you want a place to get work done or just hang out uh, and you need access, please email us. We can provide that. Uh, just a reminder, uh, during the webinar, we will be sending out the link for the Google form for the sign-in. Please do fill that out. It helps us keep a track of the number of attendees for our each webinar. This helps us get funds. So please do fill that out. So with that, we have uh, today Brianna Reyna. Uh, she is a uh, senior test and evaluation engineer at Boeing at Oklahoma City. And she's going to talk today on systems engineering role in the aerospace sector. So with that, I hand it over to Brianna. Thank you, Avinash. Yeah. Let me get my um, presentation here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yes, yeah, so like Kevin now said, my name is Bree Reyna. I graduated from OU in 2015 with my degree in mechanical engineering. I started working for Boeing uh, shortly after graduation as a systems engineer on our B-1 bomber program. So I did that for about a year and a half, uh, working with our flight deck avionics. We were doing some uh, display upgrades in the cockpit. And then after that, I transitioned to our executive transport fleet, still doing systems engineering. Uh, but this time, I got to come in on the very beginning stages of the program during the developmental phase. So I got a lot of experience kind of with systems engineering as a whole and starting with you know concept development and requirement management and derivation all the way up to the beginning stages of verification and validation. So that's what I was doing uh, before I transition now to my new job as a senior test and evaluation engineer with our French AWACS fleet. And so it'll be a little bit of uh, a learning curve, I think for me going from systems engineering into flight test engineering, but I'm very excited for the opportunity and the experiences that will come with that. Um, our plan is to 
do a, a short term assignment in central France as well for this position. Uh, so that'll be a really great experience, I think, uh, to get to, you know, work with with the French Air Force for that program. So uh, today I will be talking about systems engineering and just kind of what it is in general uh, in re regards to aerospace and kind of how we apply some of these systems engineering principles to our programs. So please feel free uh, throughout. If you have any questions, just stop me, raise your hand, ask away. And uh, yeah, just let me know if you have any questions. So what exactly is systems engineering? Uh, so systems engineering really is a transdisciplinary and integrative approach uh, for engineered systems. So when you think systems engineering, most people I think automatically go to industrial and systems engineering. So systems engineering itself does pull on some of those tenants, but it is, it's kind of its own discipline in itself. Uh, so as a systems engineer, you know, we're concerned with both the technical side as well as the business and kind of project management side of a program. So we kind of wear many hats, I would say, as a systems engineer. And, you know, we, we kind of have to maintain a big picture view of our system as a whole, which is the aircraft itself, and then all of the subsystems and other equipment that are going to be, you know, part of that overall aircraft system. Uh, so a system can consist of many different components, different elements, various subsystems, it can include hardware, it could include software, firmware, even people, information, uh, and various services. So as a systems engineer, you kind of have to become a subject matter expert in all of these various components and elements of these subsystems to make sure that you're able to successfully integrate all of these subsystems onto an aircraft. And so... As a systems engineer, we like to use what's called systems thinking, which basically is just, you know, kind of how I described earlier is just having a holistic view of your entire system and also taking into account and being able to recognize interdependencies and how, you know, things are interrelated to each other and kind of how they use each other to function in order to achieve your overall goal or objective mission performance that you're trying to achieve. So uh, as a systems engineer, I get to work a lot with various specialty teams within our programs. Uh, so for example, we have you know, air vehicle designers, we have electrical designers, we have our system safety team, and we have our stress analysts as well. We work with our human factors team, uh, just a lot of different people. And so it's very important as a systems engineer to have those cross communication skills as well and really be able to take, you know, complex integrated ideas or, or uh, these systems and be able to, you know, translate it over to, okay, what is my safety engineer need? What does my stress analyst need? What does my air vehicle engineer need? and be able to uh, work with them and make sure that you know everything that they are doing also aligns with whatever it is that you need that system to do. So it is a little bit of project management in there as well, just working with so many different teams. Um, we also have to take into account uh, cost and schedule impacts, you know, for anything that we do, as well as risk management. And so uh, I've gotten a little bit more experience with the project management side with my uh, recent job with our executive transport fleet. And so it's been really good to, to kind of wear that hat of the, the project side uh, and see how that blends with the technical aspects. So for systems engineering, uh, we do have 
some technical processes that we like to use. Uh, if you'd like to, to dive deeper into what these technical processes are, they are listed in the ISO 15288. Uh, if you'd like to read about that some more, really great in-depth explanation of these processes. Uh, and what you'll hear a lot with system engineering is the system V model, which is the picture there on the right-hand side of the chart. So the systems V uh, is just a graphical representation of you know, the various stages of the system life cycle. So the left side of the V is usually beginning stages of a project or a program where you're defining what it is that your system is needing to do, uh, what are the concept of operations, how does the end user expect to you know, use these systems and, and what is it that they want them to do and to achieve. And then from there, you'll go to your requirements definition, again, working with your customer, with your end user uh, to determine what are the specific requirements, parameters, performance measures that the system needs to achieve. And from there, you'll start to be able to derive your requirements further and eventually start getting into you know, creating your architecture, your, your physical and your functional architecture, and then starting your actual design for the system. So that's kind of all on the left side of the V. Then once you have all of that defined, you can start to move into the implementation phase, which would consist of verifying all of your components of the system, that you've done all the proper qualification testing for all of them. They're gonna be able to survive whatever environment that you're gonna install them in. And then you'll be ready for integration and installation. And then coming back up on the right side of the V, uh, you start getting into the verification and validation of you know, each of the, the system elements and components themselves, as well as part of the system as a whole. So uh, you could have you know, verification of a specific box itself and how it functions and does it survive it, the environment it's installed in. And then you would also do, okay, once we've installed this box, let's see how it interacts with the bigger system. And then you'll do your system level and verify that it's still functioning properly. And then once you've completed all of your verification and validation for your system and the components, then it's ready for release and ready for operation. And then you'll transition at that point to more of a sustainment and maintenance uh, type of support role. So you'll help with, uh, you know, if things are starting to go obsolete, if components uh, need to be repaired or replaced, uh, then that would be that, that top right side of the V. And then eventually, you know, once the system uh, has run its course and done its job, if you need to dispose of it, there's also a process for that. Um, and then replacing it with new upgraded systems. And then you start the process over again. So I just kind of wanted to, it's a very high level um, description of you know, some of these processes. There are 14 technical processes in total. I just touched on a few of them here, uh, but if anybody has any, any other questions regarding the, these technical processes, please just let me know. And a lot of these uh, in POSI is a great resource uh, if you want to learn more about systems engineering in general. They have a lot of great uh, reference material on their website, as well as the systems engineering handbook. Uh, if you'd like to read through that, uh, really great resources. So now I kind of wanted to just walk you through a little bit about you know, all of these processes and how I have seen them be applied in our um, programs that I've been a part of. So this chart is just kind of a step-by-step -step 
walkthrough, if you will, uh, of how to apply some of these systems to an aircraft uh, program or, or system. So um, at the very beginning, we have, you know, you're gonna receive your program requirements from your customer uh, or from your end user. So this typically comes to us in a statement of work that we'll receive as well as a deliverable list. So we know exactly what artifacts that the customer is expecting us to generate and that we will need to deliver to them for approval. And uh, after we receive our requirements in these various documents, we'll take them, we'll digest them, we'll start to derive uh, additional requirements uh, they, that uh, will then roll into a system specification document or a system requirement document. Uh, there are uh, various other um, kind of design documents that we will work with those other specialty teams, like I mentioned earlier, uh, to make sure that we are properly capturing you know, everything that we need to. And so as we're deriving these requirements and creating these various uh, control documents and design documents, we'll also have to consider what is our cost, what does our schedule look like, and kind of what is the scope of effort? How long do we think it's gonna take for us to you know, go and get this equipment we need uh, to verify these user requirements? How long is it gonna take for us to, you know, get them in hand to test them and make sure they work properly and then integrate them into the aircraft and finally deliver to the customer. And so we're pretty involved in that process with program management in determining what the level of, of work it's gonna take you know, to achieve all of those milestones. So once we have um, all of our requirements derived and we have the, the scope of effort, then uh, we'll move to, again, just writing those specifications, defining our size, our weight, how we're cooling. And those are the major systems that we interface with on the aircraft. And so we really have to make sure that you know our systems and our components that we're installing on the aircraft are not going to affect them in any way detrimentally or we're not pulling too much power, we're not requiring too much cooling, and you know, just the physical size of the components we're installing on the aircraft are actually going to fit. So um, there's a lot of coordination that happens with that. Um, so that fifth hexagon there, we collaborate with air vehicle and electrical designers. So they do have technical design reviews that a system engineer would be a part of. So after we've, you know, written and authored all of these uh, requirement design documents, then we will use that as our basis going into these technical design reviews and making sure, okay, is their design and what they're designing going to meet all of these requirements that we have? And if they don't, then we work with the teams to figure out design change or materials change or whatever it might be uh, in order to make sure we're going to be in compliance with those requirements. So it's very important for us as systems engineers uh, to really technically know our system very well and our components very well uh, so that you know we can be that kind of intermediary uh, with our all of our technical design teams and the customer to make sure that everything is lining up the way it should. So after technical design reviews, then we will start to coordinate with third-party suppliers or the customer, depending on um, where the, the equipment is coming from, whether we're buying it or whether we're just receiving it from the customer. Uh, we'll work with them to uh, conduct qualification testing. So a lot of this uh, hinges on the specific aircraft that it's being installed on, because each aircraft is, can be unique in its environment. And so 
you know, one aircraft might have, I don't know, a, a you know, certain um, pulling requirements for the cockpit versus another aircraft. One might be, you know, you can't exceed um, 50 degrees and the other one might be, oh, you can't exceed 75. So it, it just kind of depends. It depends on the aircraft. And so a big part of what we do as the system engineer is to do a, a research on the aircraft itself and operational environment that our systems and our uh, equipment are going to see in their lifetime. So we try to make sure that, sorry, does somebody have a question? Okay. Uh, so we just make sure that if we're working with a third, uh, third party you know, supplier that they know exactly what the environments are that the equipment needs to survive. So that way, when they do their qualification testing, we know with high confidence that, okay, this equipment, once we install it in the aircraft, it's gonna survive the environment. We don't have to worry about it. We're good. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, sometimes we have the customer who is buying the equipment and purchasing the equipment and testing it themselves. And then they just deliver it to us. So in that case, when we're just getting equipment from the government or from the customer, whoever it is, we have to look at all of the testing that they accomplished since we were not the ones controlling it. Uh, there can be uh, areas where the testing might've fallen short of the operational environment of the aircraft. So that next hexagon there perform technical analysis of qualification data becomes a little bit more involved in those cases when we were not the ones, you know, controlling the, the third party suppliers uh, and their requirements. So not only do we have to research the aircraft operational environment, we also have to start researching uh, military and industrial standards as well. So um, that was a big part of, of my job in this recent uh, systems position I was in for the executive transport aircraft. It was a lot of researching of military standards right, as well as civil standards um, and looking at the testing and, and the environmental qualification that was done on the equipment and seeing if they lined up, if they met those requirements or if they fell short. So if they fall short, um, it is quite an involved process uh, to figure out how to mitigate that and how to mitigate any risk that might you know, arise because this box was not tested to the applicable standards. And a lot of what we do, what we work with, um, is going to be installed on a military commercial derivative aircraft. So that then brings in the FAA. So we do work very closely with our FAA unit members, as well as the uh, ODA office and the military cert office. So this brings in a, a, a whole nother set of regulations that we as the systems engineers have to be very familiar with and really get to know so that when we're doing all of this technical analysis of qualification data, not only does it have to meet our aircraft operational environment, but it, we also have to make sure we're meeting the FAA certification regulations. So uh, it can get, um, very convoluted sometimes. And so it's really helpful to have access to the FAA unit members to be able to, you know, just collaborate with them, talk with them, coordinate with them and say, okay, here's all this data we have on this equipment. We think we're going to be able to meet these FAA regulations. What do you think? And so we have them there as an available resource uh, to be able to bounce ideas off of and make sure that we're 
you know, marching down the right path to getting full FAA compliance with those regulations. Another part of working with the FAA is uh, conformity. So basically what this means is we work with our third party suppliers as well as the customer to make sure that any equipment that we purchase and will install in the aircraft is all built correctly for their engineering. And so um, it is quite a process for the uh, FAA unit member to go through and inspect all of their engineering data and to make sure that, you know, they've checked every washer, they've checked every bolt, uh, they've checked all of the sealing that was used, uh, any sealant or, you know, heat treated parts or just whatever it is that they use to build their equipment, um, that they built it all correctly. So as the systems engineer, we work very closely with those FAA unit members and the third party suppliers and the customer to make sure that you know everybody's on the same page and that we've checked all of these components that are gonna be installed in the aircraft. So once we've gotten through all of this uh, effort, then we move into that right side of the V, which is the verification validation side. So the verification and validation does involve um, some actual testing, but a lot of it is us coming in on the back end and having the qualification data that you know the third party suppliers did and our requirements documents that we wrote and saying, okay, did they meet requirement one, two, three? Did they meet requirement four, five, six? And so part of the verification activities, uh, we use a uh, model-based engineering tool, which is called DOORS. And we use that to capture all of our requirements and we use it for our requirements management so that it's all kind of in one central location. Yeah. And so there's a lot of good capability within the DOORS tool. Uh, it allows you to to create linking um, between your system requirements and your verification requirements and just kind of gives you an easy roadmap to see and make sure everything is linked properly. And uh, making sure that you know everything that was performed for the qualification testing were able to verify and validate that it was done correctly and that it meets the requirements. So once we go through that exercise indoors, uh, we generate some closure documentation that captures all of the verification activities. And that is what we then deliver to our customer for their approval. And then we can move on to supporting installation of the systems onto the aircraft. So. Uh, there, there usually is some aircraft level testing that has to be done once we've installed our equipment. And so uh, as the systems engineer, you would be responsible for being there on aircraft, making sure as the system is installed and all these various components are installed, everything is interfacing correctly and properly with all of the aircraft systems. And if there's anything that goes wrong, uh, then you're there to help troubleshoot as well as be that, again, that intermediary with the customer and with your third-party suppliers uh, if you need to go back to them for any type of design change or something like that or a software change uh, and just making sure that, again, that everything is, is working properly once it's installed. And then usually that consists of ground tests and flight tests. And then after that has been completed and everything you know, is satisfactory, then we have our showing of compliance to the FAA. And when they find compliance, then they will issue our STC, which is the Supplemental Types Certification, which basically um, 
is the overarching approval of, okay, Boeing, here's your, here's the airplane. Everything is good to go. You can deliver it. Here you go, customer. And so now customer takes the airplane and our job is done. Um, so that's just kind of a, a little bit of a, of a walkthrough of, of uh, kind of how, you know, we, we apply systems engineering into our programs that we have. Um, like I mentioned, you know, systems engineering is very much a transdisciplinary approach. So it does require a lot of communication and organization across multiple disciplines. So this uh, process flow here is just a very brief snapshot of, you know, what we might have to do uh, to interact with, you know, these various teams. Uh, so you can kind of see the, the different swim lanes there that we interact with the IPT designers or the integrated product teams, our specialty teams like safety and stress and human factors and all of them, as well as the subject matter experts and then the FAA. So, um, you know, being a systems engineer, uh, you do have to work a lot with a lot of different teams, which is something that I really love about the job, uh, is just getting to work with so many different people and getting to you know, understand their perspective and how they're looking at the system, how they're looking at the aircraft. And, you know, it helps you as, as the system engineer create that sort of holistic approach, uh, holistic viewpoint, and making sure that, you know, you're, you're thinking of things that maybe you normally wouldn't have because you've you know, gathered all of these various perspectives from all of these other teams and all these other people. And so uh, it's been really, really great to get to learn, um, especially from the subject matter experts, they are our saving grace when we you know, have these, these shortfalls in, in qualification testing, for example, uh, we go to our subject matter experts and say, okay, how can we, um, address this 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 gap that we have. Uh, you know, they didn't test to the proper vibration level, or they didn't um, test to the right temperature profiles. You know, how do we still use this data that we have? And knowing our our aircraft and our operational environment, uh, are we still okay? Are we still safe to install these, you know, components on the aircraft? That's that's our main goal is making sure that on the aircraft is safe and it will not in any way you know adversely affect aircraft itself or any personnel would be around the equipment or even equipment that's located next to it as well we don't want to damage any other surrounding equipment either so all of these various uh, aspects we have to take into consideration so having subject matter experts to kind of bounce all these ideas off of has been very very helpful and then again, just working with the FAA, there's a whole lot, it's a whole nother world working with them and all of the regulations that we have to meet. Uh, they're very stringent, which is you know, obviously for a good reason. And so, um, yeah, as a system engineer, we, we definitely, we wear many hats, but it's definitely um, been a, a very great experience getting to be a system engineer. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about model-based systems engineering. This is kind of where I think we're heading towards. Uh, so MBSE basically uh, takes all of these, uh, you know, systems engineering processes and puts them into models that we can use to to try to better get a handle on everything and to kind of create more centralized hubs of data for us to use. Because a lot of our, our projects and our programs right now are very document driven. And that's mainly because of our 
our customers, you know, they require these actual, um, I'd say physical, but electronic, you know, documents that they want us to deliver to them, whether it's drawings or specifications or, um, you know, verification, documentation, whatever it may be. And so a lot of the issues that can arise with that is, you know, having all of these various documents, they could be kept in various locations and sometimes a change to a drawing or a change to architecture uh, or, you know, just a design change in general could drive a change, you know, chain reaction to a lot of other documents. And if they're not all kind of centrally located in one area, it's very, very easy for something to get missed. So MBSE helps with that uh, and helps with risk reduction of, you know, missing items or uh, also helping to detect any defects earlier in the system life cycle. And so I think a lot of our programs are trying to incorporate a little bit more of the model-based tools like Cameo, uh, if you've heard of Cameo. Um, we do use doors, like I mentioned, that is one. Uh, we're also moving towards a little more uh, agile as well and trying to incorporate some of those tools to try to help us, you know, just just get a better uh, grasp on on everything that we have to do because it is a lot of of different, you know, things that we're involved in as as a system engineer. And so trying to keep it all together sometimes can get a, a little difficult. So uh, I think MBSE is the way of the future for a lot of the the projects that we're going to be doing. Um, I'm currently uh, getting my master's in system engineering and a lot of what we're doing in that is model-based tools. Um, and so it's kind of opened my eyes a bit to, to see how, you know, this can really help improve a lot of what, what we do as a systems engineer in our projects. And so um, I think it's going to be really exciting to see where MBSE goes and where it takes us. And again, just uh, I just listed the the resources here in case you wanted to read more or learn more about systems engineering. Uh, so the Encozy handbook, as well as the IEEE International Standards, um, those are very very great tools and resources. Uh, systems engineering is very very process oriented, so having resources like this uh, is definitely super helpful. And I just have my my email listed there um, in case you have any follow-up questions or uh, you just wanted to send me an email. Um, so feel free to, to write that down and feel free to email me uh, anytime. So I think that was all I had for my presentation. Thank you, Brianna. So now if anyone has questions, please free to ask, yeah. Any comments, uh, Diego, Rakesh? Yes, I have a probably a, a silly question. <laughs> um, sure. Have you ever had the opportunity to work with the um, space system integrations, in the in the branch of the space, such as spacecraft or something like that? Mm -hmm. uh, no, personally, I have not. Had that opportunity um but you know i know boeing does have a lot of space related programs um unfortunately i don't think we really have any in oklahoma city mm -hmm. um they're you know at our other sites um around the u.s but no i haven't had any experience with space systems thank you thank you any comments on model-based systems engineering from people? 
This, this is a very interesting idea. Hi. May I? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, just a comment. Uh, I was wondering how, um, uh, because a lot of things are going to be outsourced. It may not be the military grade, but uh, I don't know whether you were also involved in civilian aircrafts because uh, they are going to get, uh, you know, thousands of, um, you know, at least uh, millions, I can say, millions of uh, dollars worth of stuff they are going to import for the aircraft from a huge manufacturing facility they are developing in Bangalore, uh, where I belong to actually. So uh, my question is about outsourcing. Like if you are going to integrate a lot of outsourced systems or subsystems or components into your uh, assembly, um, there will be a lot of quality control issues. There will be a lot of compatibility issues. So will it also be inside the model or how do you modify or adopt a model for accommodating um, stuff coming not in one Boeing, one plant, but it's going to come from all over the world, say, then how do you accommodate that? Thank you. Right. Yes. No, good question. Uh, so a lot of that, you know, comes down to working with our quality team. We do have a QA team we work with that is working with all of our suppliers as well uh, to make sure that, you know, they are meeting appropriate uh, standards uh, and, you know, all of the parts that they're producing are meeting standards that they need to. And so we also make sure to write those kinds of clauses into our uh, requirement documents that we would give to, let's say, a third party, you know, test house or supplier we write that in as part of the requirements that they will need to meet and they'll have to produce artifacts that prove that yes, they did meet all of these appropriate standards. Do we have anybody from industrial and systems engineering uh, here today? People from industrial and systems Yeah, I follow. So, what sort of comments, questions do you have for Bree? Because she, what she's talked about here is very much uh, foundational to industrial and systems engineering. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really nice. And uh, so uh, I'm working with Janet and Farooq uh, as a PhD student uh, in industrial and systems engineering. And so it was really interesting to know about model-based systems engineering because uh, in one of our recent uh, research work about uh, designing public policy, we are using this concept as the foundational element uh, where we are trying to uh, build up models which will integrate social integration strategies, uh, social environment that we would have, uh, and the problem structure. Uh, so basically, we are focusing on the environmental justice as of now, uh, but it can be generalized to anything. So it was really interesting to know about how is it uh, applied in the uh, aerospace right now, and uh, the it was it was very insightful for that. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, you know it's it's been really interesting to to learn more about it. Uh, as I said in my uh, master's program, currently we're we're using a lot of Cameo. Yeah. And um, so it's been yeah, it, it kind of opened my eyes like oh wow, this would be really awesome if we were able to incorporate you know, more mm -hmm. of this into our day-to-day -day, uh, jobs. And so I know it. it's it's starting to slowly, but mm -hmm. it's definitely going to take, take a lot of effort, I think, for it to be kind of an enterprise-wide move, you know, towards more model-based engineering. Yeah. Um, but I definitely see the, the positivity from it and how it could really, really help a lot. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Shadi, uh, Shiavas? Uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. It's very good and it's uh, very useful. Uh, I ha um, you, uh, your uh, presentation shows a good path uh, that's Artificial um, aircraft application uh, perspective, I think. Um, but uh, for the research, uh, for the customer service 
uh, I don't know. Um, maybe uh, it is um, very good if uh, have uh, some um, some survey for uh, the um, for the customers. Do you have a survey uh, for this application? I don't know if we have surveys uh, that we conduct with with our customers. Um, you know, as we work with them throughout a program, a lot of, there's there's usually a lot of communication back and forth with our customer. Um, that's also a, a big part of, of being the system engineer is being that technical point of contact for the customer. So uh, throughout the life of a project, um, you know, we work very closely with them, uh, especially uh, on issues that may arise and how to, uh, you know, work through that and how can we avoid it in the future. Have so we do kind of work with them on that. Yeah. Okay. Have some tools for the uh, connecting the customers. And I think it is the applica your application that you, per your, uh, you shows. Uh, it's the connecting with customers and for the um, for the service of the um, of the customers and um, I think it is uh, very good uh, have a, some uh, survey I think uh, if it is possible I don't know is mm -hmm. it possible or not <laughs> uh yeah no I I definitely think it would be possible um. And I, I know that they they do give us feedback, I think on a, usually every quarter um, and we'll have, you know, performance reviews with them as well. And so we'll talk about various things, uh, how we can improve, what did we learn? What can we do better? That kind of thing. So yes, we do try to, to get, get their feedback. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right, so Janet Allen, uh, she offers a course titled Systems Engineering. And much of what Bree talked about today in terms of the V diagram, uh, uh, how it's implemented in NASA, not Boeing so much, but in NASA, the advantages and disadvantages of using the V diagram and also model-based engineering uh, is covered by Janet Allen in a course titled ISC 5033. The title of the course is Systems Engineering. And it's on Monday, Wednesday in spring. Uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. So uh, those of you who are interested in that may like to take that course. Uh, I'm a great believer in systems engineering, a great, great believer in systems engineering and also model-based engineering. Uh, the, 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 uh, if you look at a engineering problem, it's not just mechanical or electrical or civil or something like that. The common language is computational models. The the challenge then is to come along and say, how do these computational models talk to each other? Because the variables are different. The, the way in which the model, the fidelity of the model is different. Uh, the, the, and models are approximations of reality. And if you have models that are approximate, approximations of reality, then a single point solution cannot be used to go along and make it happen because that single point solution when you use optimization is on the boundary of the solution space. And it's at the, the very uh, furthest place that you could have that. And the objective function has to be perfect. So how do you make that happen? So, so those are the challenges in model-based uh, engineering. The idea that the models are approximations of reality. And then how do you, how do you find solutions that are relatively insensitive relatively insensitive to uncertainty and noise. Because if the models are not perfect, then you can't say this is the solution and work with it. And particularly when you have uh, different models coming from different domains, like fluid mechanics and structures, how do you resolve those things so that there is compatibility between what's taking place? So that is a very interesting and exciting area to be involved in. Anything else? <laughs> Right, Avinash, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Brianna, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think if we don't have any, 
I think we have something from Elijah. Yeah, he's just talking about Professor Jalen's uh, Janet Allen's course. Okay. So I'm going to stop recording and then in our usual.